All right, we've talked enough movies. I've given you my best Netflix shows of the year. Today, I'm giving you my best overall shows of the year. So what makes the list? Well, that's what the video's for. What is up, Flick fans and fans of Amazon Prime and Netflix and Hulu and HBO Max, all of those things today, we are talking what I believe to be the best TV shows that I've seen this year. And obviously, I haven't seen every show, but I have seen over 70. So am I a psychopath? Probably. If you guys want to help the video, dropping a like would be awesome. And please let me know what show did I miss. There's always one or two that I feel like I have to get around to. Let me know in the comments down below. And let's get into, uh, first of all, some shows that either I didn't get a chance to finish just yet, and I will, or series that I just missed altogether. I did not see Cyberpunk Edge Runners. Heard amazing things about it. I have two episodes left of The White Lotus, and because of my house flood, I just haven't had a chance to finish it. And a couple of episodes left of The Bear, I would probably put that in my top 10, but again, it's just not one I've been able to finish. I haven't watched the new season of Barry, and I'm kicking myself, as well as Russian Doll. Probably the biggest one for me is Peaky Blinders, one of my favorite shows ever. Still have a few episodes left. And then Afterlife, the brand new season on Netflix. Those are just a few, but I know there's many, many more. Let's get into my honorable mentions. And this list includes The Legend of Fox Machina on Amazon Prime. I had no clue this was going to be as good as it was. The Sandman, dark, eerie, great atmosphere. That one's on Netflix. Outer Range, season one with Josh Brolin, a series that kept me intrigued the entire time over on Amazon Prime. Back on Netflix, we have All of Us Are Dead, a zombie show that was super entertaining. Upload season two, Amazon Prime. Not as good as the first season, but uh, this is a show that has me hooked at this point. Season five, Cobra Kai on Netflix. I'm always going to stand for this show. Is that what the kids say? I don't know. Alice in Borderlands Season 2. Uh, season 2 was a great addition to what we got in Season 1, and I cannot wait to see if there's more of this show. Reacher Season 1. Jack Reacher, a massive surprise. I'm sad it didn't crack my top 10. How about Heartstopper on Netflix? Uh, great chemistry between the cast, a nice coming-of-age romance. And then finally, only Murders in the Building Season 2. So bummed it didn't crack my top 10, but I'm in love with the show, the main cast, and really, just the idea of bringing this trio together every season. It's the best. At number 10, we have Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer, Evan Peters, a uh, series that I forgot to put on my Netflix list until the last second, but I didn't forget this time. This was so eerie. This captured the tone and the atmosphere that I thought was so appropriate for this real life person. It's going to make you feel uncomfortable, kind of sick to your stomach, but it all comes down to the performance of Evan Peters, and it's a Ryan Murphy show. And Ryan Murphy, he's brought us some great stuff in the past, but lately it's just been kind of an up and down. It's been a roller coaster. Every single series is drastically different from the last. Dahmer takes itself as seriously as you need it to. Again, I use the word atmosphere, maybe the best of any show I've watched this year, and it reminds me of Mindhunter. It's my Mindhunter fix, right? Not as good, obviously it's not David Fincher, but it felt that way while you were watching, and the court case scenes, and uh, just the tragic aspect of how this, this happened in real life. It's going to make you feel uncomfortable. Evan Peters, I think, deserves a look at an Emmy. Next up, I'll keep this brief. It's a season five, so you're only going to care if you've invested yourself into all five uh, seasons of this great show, The Last Kingdom. Uhtred, we are following his journey through four seasons, and we start out in season five, and everything is going crazy. It's hectic. It is of the quality of a Game of Thrones, of a Vikings. This is the type of show you watch to get invested in. And now that you know it has a great start, few middle seasons that maybe aren't as good as other ones, but the quality remain consistent. And a season five, and I'm telling you this as a fan, that gives you a great sense of finality, a payoff to all of the storylines introduced. Unlike another show that I just mentioned, Game of Thrones... <laughs> Oh, I'm actually coughing. <laughs> and just the way Uhtred speaks. I am Uhtred. I can't even do it. I don't even want to try to do it. Everything about this show, the dialogue, the quality, the battle sequences in season five. A couple of storylines that maybe I want, but they're all minor complaints to an otherwise awesome show. It's worth a watch. This final season was great. Do you really wanna, do you really wanna if I 
took the time to learn the intro dance. That would have been so cool. I mean, you would have been watching this video like, oh man, he took the time to learn all that stuff. I don't have time to do that. I, well, maybe I do now, but I don't want to do it. It's, it's an awesome introduction, but how is the show? How is the series? Well, you're actually giving Peacemaker a lot of quality depth. A backstory that makes you care about this character and the team and the fact that it stood up to the Suicide Squad because I was a big fan of that movie. But I think the quality of Peacemaker is just as good, if not better, than Suicide Squad. And you have time to flesh out a story that's a little bit overly ridiculous, but at the same time, that's what these characters are. And John Cena thrives. You're going to give me flack over this, but I said The Rock was actually really good as Black Adam in Black Adam, but he was being The Rock. It's not like he was uh, turning into this other character. No, this is a little different. John Cena, I mean, there are a couple moments here, the scene where he's playing the piano, and I'm just like, this guy can act. I I've been giving him flack for a few years. Great comedic actor. No, he has emotional range. He shows that in Peacemaker. And this is the prime example of why I'm excited for James Gunn to take over DC. I'm bummed about some of the stuff that's happening. Uh, but this is a quality television show with great comedy, great action, and a really good main character. How about Blackbird? Taron Edgerton, Paul Walter Hauser, two of the best performances you're going to see on television this year. It's on Apple TV+, Plus, and it's all about our main character who gets this offer. If he can elicit a confession from a suspected killer, who seems like the obvious suspect here, Jimmy will be freed. Completing this mission becomes a challenge, though, because of the relationship that forms between the two and some of these conversations. This is a show that runs through the dialogue. It is... A story that will, like Dahmer, unnerve you, make you feel the fear of those around our main characters, but also those in contact with Paul Walter Hauser's character of Larry. Oh my God, he's incredible. And it's very obvious that he can bring about this type of performance because we've seen it before. We've actually seen similar performances from Paul Walter Hauser, but this is taking it up a notch. And that dynamic between he and Taryn's character, and Taryn is giving a phenomenal performance here. I love a show like this. I mentioned Mindhunter. We've talked about Dahmer. This one's a bit different. It doesn't go as in-depth and in detail as maybe a Dahmer does. With six episodes, not introducing a ton of plot points to have to try and balance and all of these random characters. No, the focus is the best part of Blackbird, and I was engaged the entire time. Love this show. It deserves my top 10. How about season three of The Boys? The fact that this is so low on my list bums me out because I loved season three. I had a great time with it. I wasn't as, you know, in awe as maybe I was in season one, and there aren't as many shocking moments in season three other than one episode that everybody was waiting on, the Herogasm episode, and I still think they could have taken that up another notch. Regardless, Homelander. Freaking Homelander. He is unleashed, especially by the time you get to the end of season three. But now there's a new guy in town, Captain America. I mean, Soldier Boy. Their version of a bad Captain America. Butcher and Huey, there is a superpower aspect to this season that kind of... I mean, we knew it was coming from the trailers, but when that plays out and you get some of these fight sequences, it's awesome. It's just so much fun to see. The storyline between Homelander and his son, everything that's going on with Compound V and the government, there's just so much to love about season three of The Boys. I can't wait for season four. It's one of the best shows on TV by far. Severance, another Apple TV Plus show. This one's in the sci-fi genre. I knew this would be interesting. Interesting. I like the idea of Ben Stiller being at the helm, and you have a lot of really talented actors here. Adam Scott does a great job in this series. But the question they ask here is, what if you could divide your consciousness between your work life and your home life? And there's a procedure that takes place that separates these two versions, and that's basically the idea of what this show starts with. But twists and turns along the way and you end up in a place that you never expected by the time you get to that finale in season one and that's what i want out of a tv show i want it to keep me on my toes i want it to keep me invested i want to learn about these characters grow with these characters uh, but not know who to trust and not know where it's going that's what severance is i think it's the most satisfying first season of a sci-fi television show since maybe lost i may be forgetting one or two but i am so engaged with this story and I am so bummed I didn't review it. I'm so bummed. That's on me. But you know what? It made my list because it's great. How about a show that I gave you a review for but I only watched the first three to four episodes. Told you guys that in the review. And it took me a bit to catch up. 
I was trying to go as the weeks progressed. I just got behind, but it started to really shock me as I learned that this was not going in the direction that I thought it was going to go at all. And it allowed me to understand who Cassian Andor is so much better than what I even knew from Rogue One. I'm a massive fan of Rogue One. It's genuinely one of my favorite Star Wars movies. So my expectations were lofty. First three episodes, I enjoyed. I thought they were good. But then the show kind of takes a turn and becomes more adult. And Tony Gilroy is getting to tell the story that he wants to tell here, right? It has just enough of that connection to the Star Wars universe to where it's going to keep fans satisfied. But I think non-fans of what they've done lately in Star Wars, they can watch this and say, this is just a great sci-fi show. It's just an awesome attempt at something different in the universe. More adult, but at the same time, anyone can watch it and get invested in these characters and the rebellion, the space prison sequence at the end, the relationships that are formed, the new characters, the old characters. There's so much in Andor to appreciate it. And boy, I wish, I wish I would have done an update video on Andor, but I will tell you this, I was so just happy once it ended because we've obviously been disappointed in some of these other Star Wars shows like Boba Fett. A lot of people hated Obi-Wan. I didn't hate it, but I'll tell you this. Andor is the best thing they've done since The Mandalorian, and it might be better than The Mandalorian. Austin, you're gonna put Stranger Mid over Andor? You're gonna put Mid things? What else do the kids say? I'm not one of those overboard Eddie fans. Okay, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Eddie, but you know what I'm talking about, the people on the TikToks. Listen, this is a series that continuously impresses me, but not until season four have I been this invested in what's happening to these characters. It is sad that the nostalgia's kind of gone now because the kids have grown up or they are growing up, they've moved away, they're separated, but all of the storylines introduced in season four were great, but Vecna really provides that villain. And you go back and watch some of these older episodes that they have, been building up to for all three seasons. Season four is the culmination of that. We get uh, revelations about a character like Eleven. You look at these performances, obviously Millie Bobby Brown, the standout for me, David Harbour, Sadie Sink is incredible in season four. I am shocked that she was maybe even better than anyone else in this show. Uh, so you get great performances, you get great writing. There are some things that you know maybe don't go the way that the fans want them to go, but a culmination, an amazing finale. I believe it was episode seven that had running up the hill and that's all we heard all summer. Well, that's because the show not only got really popular, but it had the quality to back it up. And I love Stranger Things. I'm not apologizing for that. The exploration of the Targaryen dynasty I did not think would be this fascinating. I did not think going back in time and exploring what would happen before Game of Thrones would be something that I would get fully invested in and, and wait every single week. Like you all didn't get screeners for House of the Dragon. I tried. HBO probably took one look at me and said, that guy does not deserve screen, or he asked too late. That's probably what it was. Amazing season of television. When the king names his daughter Rhaenyra to heir the Iron Throne. People don't like it. They're not happy, especially when he has a son. And even at that point, she retains that status as heir. And this causes a division across the realm and friction between characters, between longtime friends turned enemies by the last episode. Uh, but this is also a brutal season of television. There are numerous scenes involving birth, I mean, a couple, one in the first episode, one in the last, that just had me shocked. I mean, my jaw was on the floor, and I usually can't handle stuff like that. Oh my god. You know, in Game of Thrones, for a while, the big thing was like, oh, when are we going to see a dragon? In House of the Dragons, it's just like, here's one every episode, and you just get the awesomeness and the amazing visual effects that look so, I mean, grand. Especially in the last episode, you get a battle in the air between two dragons, but it really is the relationships and the friction between all of these houses and people in the same family, and uh, that division tears them apart over the last couple of episodes. And the finale is one that has me salivating for another season. I can't wait for the next season of House of the Dragon. I was so invested, the week-to-week -week investment, that's why, listen, I love a good binge, but that's why I love that method. From Andor, even though I was late on that, to House of the Dragon, uh, to The White Lotus, which I still have two more episodes of, that's how it's done, and it worked very well. 
seeing Jimmy's transformation throughout all of these seasons, and obviously we're seeing pre-Breaking Bad, post-Breaking Bad, what happened in the midst of that, but really, it's the culmination of all of that in season six, parts one and two that worked so well for me. And you get some of the more satisfying moments in Breaking Bad history in this final season. Now, not everyone was fully satisfied with the finale. I completely understand why. But I watched it and I said, that's that's how it's done. That's how a finale is done. You leave the audience wanting more. But you also leave us knowing that we just witnessed one of the best character arcs in television history. Actually... Two or three of the best, because we cannot forget about Rhea Seahorn as Kim. And there are a couple of episodes in season six that will have you in tears. You know the moment I'm talking about where she's on the bus. That moment with Kim was phenomenal. And then you see years later, and I don't want to get into spoilers, that's not what this video is. That relationship pick right back up and the commitment from Bob Odenkirk towards this show. You can tell he cares so much about this character. And we get so many moments in season six. It's just like, yes, whether it's a callback or a line or a moment with Gus or Mike or characters that we know and love from Breaking Bad. But then the new characters, Nacho, Howard. And I'm not just talking about season six, I'm talking about the whole show, but season six was good enough to be fully satisfying as a fan of Better Call Saul. It is right now. Well, it's no longer on television. Maybe that's succession. Uh, but Better Call Saul, as it was on, was the best show on television. That's why season six is my number one season from 2022. But what's coming out in 2023? Well, I have a video talking about what's coming out in 2023 coming to this channel very soon and stay tuned because I have plenty of reviews guys that's what I do I talk about Netflix Amazon Prime Hulu so if you want to follow along on this journey as soon as they build my house back up because it flooded I'll be back in the studio and I'll be working as hard as I can for you guys in 2023 thanks so much for watching thanks for dealing with my lunacy uh, and comment your lists down below